the Auckland CBD where they're trying to build a city rail link. We have a lot of our panels in there. We are finding a way, as you said, to baffle the noise, to soak it up before it gets to the rebounding stages. Um, so my first question will be around then, how did you get into the business of Canvas with Durifix? Um, yeah, well, <clears throat> I guess um, it's possibly more the other way around. The business started doing the Canvas side and then Duraflex was formed as a result of it. Um, so we were a uh, uh, two or three man family business that was doing Canvas covers, boat covers, uh, one off repairs and that kind of thing for anyone that walked in off the street. Um, and we still do them to a certain extent, although it's not a core focus. Um, Duraflex was really born out of seeing a need in um, noise noise proofing construction sites pretty much um, there was a big issue around too much noise especially in city centres um, busy areas where there's a lot of pedestrian traffic so we created a, um, with a little bit of help of some other people around we've created a, some temporary noise barriers that companies will then surround their sites with um, that was really the initiation of Duraflex with the, the Hush Tech range the Hush Tech is our soundproofing range I was wondering about that because uh, unlike a lot of manufacturing businesses, you've actually done something really smart, which is to to segment the the manufacturing into different um, you know vertical businesses, if you like, with hush tech and green tech and smart tech. Uh, and that was one of my questions: was which one did you start with? So it is hush tech. Um, what are the things that uh, make noise on site, and then what's the the regulation around minimising that noise, at least within the, the New Zealand um, business framework? That's a good question. So my mind goes straight to um, the Auckland CBD where they're trying to build a city rail link. Um, we have a lot of our panels in there. There's a lot of people walking past. Possibly the, the um, piece of equipment that makes the most noise on site will be rollers or excavators. Um, the excavators then have... Um, what they call a rock breaker attachment on the end, which is for breaking up. It's basically a big hydraulic pick for breaking rock. Um, so those are, we were looking at the most uh, noisiest pieces of equipment on site and how we could mitigate that noise in terms of ensuring the, the level of noise at the footpath or where the pedestrians are, even in the offices and the high rises next door um, was the lowest. So we've, um, our standard panels hang on temporary fencing we created they are one size fits all um we fully brand them we've got our own in-house printer so the the likes of higgins and downer uh, fletchers and um, they all get their logos printed on the front um so it's all marketing for them but then we um spent a lot of time with the contractors on site and found that the actual break at attachment on the end of the digger was more of an issue um so we've created a custom blanket that fits around those um around every different size from a, a two ton excavator up to a 50 ton. Um, so they wrap it around. It's like a big sock that goes over it and it keeps it quiet. So, Which makes well, a whole lot, lot more, more sense if you think about it, because if you're in one of those high rises uh, down on Queen Street, uh, you're going to have a different noise profile than the pedestrian walking past. And, and maybe those, uh, those fencing panels do the job. But if you're six stories up, you really want the noise to be baffled at the point it's being made, which will be, you know, on that actual uh, rock breaker itself. Yeah, that's right. So um, a lot of the noise um, nuisance is the rebounding of noise between those buildings. So what we've essentially done is we are finding a way, as you said, to baffle the noise, to soak it up before it gets to the rebounding stages. And I like uh, what you've done there with the, the marketing branding side of it as well, because when you put a, a logo, whether it's Fletcher's or Fulton Hogan on a site, there's a level of pride that goes with knowing that that's your site. And, um, you know, if you're minimizing the noise impact, you're actually making things easier to continue in terms of, of business or in terms of um, inner city uh, dwellings and living while we grow our, our bigger city. Yeah, that's right. <clears throat> Excuse me. So, the um, the likes of those companies, we offer branding to them as a as a free extra. Um, it's something that the competition doesn't offer. It's 
something that stands them out um, with their marketing. On every um, on every panel we seek to have our hashtag brand on there with a QR code that links straight to our website with any FAQs on it, um, installation guides, that kind of thing. So all the information is there at the click of a button should the guys on the ground not understand how it works. Excellent. Along, that- with, the, along with any follow-up sales support that we might do. Um, we have been on site in some of those CBD projects helping the guys fit them to, to machinery just to show them how it works. What does it mean for the the workers in terms of their their own ability to communicate with each other? Is there a safety element there? Do they still require earmuffs uh, individually? Um, it, noise is a funny thing. That depends on how close they are to the noise source. Um, although, as as we said earlier, we're mitigating it at the source. So, you know, when they're standing. 20 to 50 meters away where they would have needed earmuffs they no longer do because of our solution that's on the on the um, digger that's generating the noise so that's excellent because in terms of uh, if you're a worker and you have um, you know you're having to wear earmuffs it does sometimes feel like you're a degree removed away from the situation around you so by able to if you're able to not have to wear those items can make you feel a little bit more present to some of the things happening around you, the dangers. Yeah, that's exactly right. Yeah. So that's, that's, I guess where we're coming from. We're out there to try and make it safer, not only for those that are working on the site, but those that are going past it. And it's less, less um, frustrating for those that live beside it or, or walking past it. Now the the hush tech range that's only one of um, a number of ranges for Duraflex. You've also got green tech and smart tech. Um, I, I was reading that you know part of your green tech solution actually stops you know tons of rubbish entering the Wellington Harbour, for example. Um, how does it do that? Well, how have you managed to take canvas and, and turn it into you know an, an environmental protection product? Yeah, it's another good question. So. In, in the canvas business, we, uh, we're obviously dealing with a lot of different materials, from a mesh to a, a waterproof canvas to a, you know, to a lot of different fabrics. Um, and one of them was this open weave mesh that we we're just talking to some locals here in, in the small town of Cole, where we operate, and they asked if if we'd ever thought of making something that would stop rubbish entering the waterways. Um, and that we hadn't thought of it at, at that point, but from then we developed a, a solution that, um, yeah, it fits in any wa- any uh, wastewater pipe. It'll just have a net that removes once it's full. Um, if there's a massive flood or deluge of water coming through, it'll automatically release, but stay connected to the pipe just so it doesn't cause a blockage or a flood upstream. Um, and yeah, they, as, as you said, we are catching a lot of rubbish going into the harbors. Um, I think one particular net in Wellington, there's uh, between four and five kgs of plastic waste a, a week getting caught in it out of one outlet. What's the, the, the flow on benefits there for the, the, I'm assuming it's the local council, local body councils who are who are the client in this um, regard. What What's the flow on benefit for them in terms of keeping the, the city clean? So one of the biggest ones we've found is the... Um, the the time they spend picking up rubbish from the side of rivers and waterways, um, a lot of that rubbish comes out of the obviously the wastewater from the side of the road from people dumping litter on the on the roads are getting washed down the wastewater system. So if we can capture that before it enters the rivers, then it saves the council a lot of work in picking it up from the side of the rivers or potentially getting out to sea. So it's a it's a one off installation rather than ongoing. Uh, labor body and hands to go and pick up rubbish yeah that's right so the um, local body councils that have got the nets installed there's a number of them from Kerry Kerry to Invercargill um, how they generally run it is up to them but most of them are doing like a, a two weekly maintenance check depending on depending on you know the area and the amount of litter that comes through um, and generally every couple of weeks when they're going around mowing the lawns or doing their rubbish bin empties they'll just check the net empty it, put it back in, and leave, leave it. So, That's awesome technology. It's almost like every council should have that. Um, 
a bugbear of mine is the the cigarette butts how how fine a net does this put like what size of rubbish does it get down to catching um that's a good question and it's a question that most councils ask around catching cigarette butts we can do it that small that would catch every cigarette butt but on the other hand as you start catching every leaf and branch that goes down as well um, and it blocks up a lot faster so there's a fine line we've had a couple of different sizes that we've used based on what the councils require um, but it more comes back to how much they want to catch versus how much they want to empty it versus you know any potential risks of flooding if we catch too much so we can do it if you need it but yeah there's some challenges and then uh, let's then talk about the, the third area of the business, the smart tech, which seems completely separate yet again, instead of being outside solutions here for construction or um, for environmental protection, uh, your smart tech ones are actually for clean rooms. So I'm, I'm assuming that some of the New Zealand made manufacturers I visited would have some of your PVC curtains, for example, installed. Yes. Yeah. So the smart tech is more, um, once again, goes back to the canvas initiation where we had a lot of experience with just different materials, different shape and size covers, um, and it became pretty evident that there was a need for clean rooms, for um, dust protection factory dividers, you know, for instance, if it's a manufacturing facility where you might have an engineering side on one half of it and a fabrication on the other, or, you know, you've got to try and stop dust getting from one side of the factory to the other, um, a PVC factory divider is a lot cheaper than a solid wall um, and it also gives you the, the capabilities of pulling it back if you need one big open factory okay so you're it, it's actually a, a almost a, either a temporary barrier or it's a barrier between different parts of the manufacturing process um, to keep it clean from maybe a finishing area versus the the actual area where all the cutting and the the dirt's coming from yeah, that's right. Yeah, so it is more of a, a temporary, although we have done permanent structures, we have done complete clean rooms for um, some manufacturing facilities doing very, very dust sensitive manufacturing. So they've got to keep all the dust out. So we have done 100% dust proof rooms as well with it. Anything it on the, the medical side, the you know, the super clean manufacturing when it comes to the hygiene or, or into the, the food preparation side of things? Uh, yes, we've done a lot into the food preparation side. Um, that brings a, a next level of complexity to it, but it's not impossible um, in terms of all our fixings need to be stainless. There's a, a lot of extra stuff, a lot of extra cost that goes into that kind of thing. Uh, regarding the health, we've done a little bit into the health. We did a number of um, see-through barriers when the COVID initially hit for different hospitals and DHBs. Um, that was more reactive you know we did it because we had the capacity to do so it's not one of our main focuses in the smart tech range um, so one of the biggest ones in the smart tech range is possibly more like um, fertilizer plants places that um, create a lot of dust when when a, a truckload or a, or a unit load of something is is emptied more just mitigating that dust so it doesn't go through offices and all that kind of thing so because yeah manufacturing sites do get dirty there's just no getting around it and uh, um, even though you you make best efforts there's there's still going to be dust around so you're mitigating that as, as much as possible yeah that's right yeah so we'll do anything from um, you know a small two meter by two meter curtain up to I forget how the big the biggest one was, but it was something like 16 metres high by 100 metres long or something. Wow. I forget the exact dimensions, but yeah, there's always a way to do it. Where does, Bernie, where does all the, because, um, you know, across these different sectors, there's a lot of research and development that's got to go into this. There's a lot of intellectual property that you'll end up creating through understanding these problems. Uh, where does the the innovation come from? Have you got a whole team that works on this, just solving problems day in day out? Um, not exactly. It probably, um, I don't know. I don't, I don't know if we've got a team of innovators or not. But uh, our father, there's three of us boys in it, plus our father. 
um, and he's been in the in the trade and the canvas and fabrication trade for 35 years. Um, so basically, anything that comes along, he's he's already seen it, um, and he loves inventing. So I guess a combination of us boys with the the minimal experience we've had along with his, um, we always find a way to do it. And I guess that's the beauty um, about your show as well. But it's promoting Kiwi. Um, and there's a certain element of Kiwi ingenuity to pretty much everything that goes on here. Hey, just a quick interruption. Thanks for watching a Kiwi original. If you're liking this episode, then hit the notification button. And that means you'll see when every new episode gets released. We've done 40 already. We've got another 50 lined up. Right, now back to the episode. What are the, um, what are the complementary skills that if it was one of your brothers sitting here having the chat that that uh, they would be be talking about you know how do you work as a as a family business um it's a good question i think i think it would be fair to say we we wouldn't function if all four of us weren't in it um obviously we're brothers we have fights <laughs> things aren't always smooth sailing um one of them is oversees all the sales so more manages the sales um one of my brothers manages all the marketing which as you've seen he does a fantastic job um and yeah between dad and me we try and keep the whole thing upright so how did your dad get into it originally he was um initially working for the owner of the canvas company uh-huh. Um, and it got to a point where his own boys were coming through school and he figured he wanted to have something going for them. So, um, yeah, he purchased the business in around 2001. Um, at the time it was, yeah, it was only a one man band. So how many employees have you got now? Oh, there's 22 of us, I believe. Wow. I, I think you're, so, you're very fortunate to, um, you know, I think anyone who grows up with uh, a parent who is running a business, you you get to learn a lot of things just through osmosis because you know, you're in and around that business um, because it's around the kitchen table at home as well as in at work. And certainly that was my upbringing, so you could never avoid it. And sometimes it got a bit frustrating because you just wanted to play and have fun. And instead, you got to spend half a day in the in the inventory room at work because um, parents are, are working. Um, but but in terms of Duraflex, you're, you're not standing still either. You, just before we started speaking here, you were talking about another um, business that you've acquired that, that many Kiwis would probably na- know the name of. Um, tell us about that. Yeah, so just going back to the Duraflex side, um, if I just, you don't mind me recapping on it briefly, the hash tech, is possibly the area we're pushing. Um, we have got a global distribution of the Hush Tech product right throughout Australia, the US, Canada, and the UK. So that Hush Tech name with uh, the Kiwi made on it is uh, yeah being distributed worldwide. So that's possibly our biggest focus in terms of well not only local sales but also export. Although the export at the moment is not so good, but we're, we're confident it'll pick up again i mean yeah countries always have to be improving their built environment so there's no doubt that the number of um number of cranes you see around the world in our you know the biggest cities each one of those is going to have something going on at ground level uh, that is going to be creating a a lot of noise uh, whether that's in london or or new york or um, some of the developing economies um and this is something you've got uh, trademarks around too. Yes, Pay that's things. right. Yeah. Awesome. So back to your question, um, the new yeah, the new business we acquired in February, um, a company called Kiwi Tarps, specialising in rollback tarps on trucks, bin trucks. You've possibly seen them. Um, this was uh, resulted from discussions with the owner. To be honest. Um, he was looking for an alternative supplier to make the covers. Um, and it was something we had capacity to do, although it wasn't our core focus. Um, but we were 
young and hungry and willing to get our hands on anything we could to try and make some money. Um, and yeah, then he offered it to us for sale. So we took it over uh, February. Um, we, we've kept employing the previous owner and all his staff. Um, so we basically just transitioned it over to here. He was he was previously buying all his product out of Australia. Um, basically, the minute we took the business over, that stopped, and it's all manufactured locally. Awesome to hear. And these are the the tarps you see on the the sides of some of the the larger trucks, like FMCG goods, the the New Worlds, the foodstuffs, uh, anyone doing cargo as well. I'm assuming. Yeah, so there's two different sides. There's obviously the curtain sides, the, the sliding curtain siders, um, and then the, the main focus is um, more covers on bin trucks, ah, such right. as ones cutting wood chip and things like that that can blow out. Um, traditionally, they've they've had a, a flat tarp that the driver has to get up on top of and roll out, which in today's health and safety world is not ideal. Um so with our design, it's fully cable driven. The driver can stand on the ground and operate it from a handle on the side of his truck. So no need to climb up, no need to accidentally fall off or fall in either. Because beforehand, would they, would they be kind of doing a, a dance around the lid of the bin in order to unsecure or secure their load? How did they do it before? Yeah, they, they were. It was a balancing act, I believe, on top of the load um, to get the cover on so it doesn't flap and blow off. But yeah, not fall off yourself. Um, the other advantage in the system that we're offering is the deployment of your cover across your load is all of 15 seconds as opposed to the traditional way was probably 15 to 20 minutes. So it's saving the average truck driver a lot of time in the course of a week. Wow. So you, you'd have to you to cover your load, then uncover your load. So there's at least 40 minutes a day if you're just doing that one trip. If you're doing two or three, it's a couple of hours every day. That adds up if you've got a fleet of... 30 or 40 drivers that's right yeah and it's just becoming more and more um, required by authorities especially local tips and recycling places that if anyone's bringing a load of product in there they've got to have it covered just so there's no rubbish flying around so as we're talking here I'm, I'm seeing there's some themes isn't there there's um, making sure that when you've got a a, um, a load of something that it stays in there, it doesn't pollute the environment, making sure that if uh, a council is in charge of keeping a city clean, that the that rubbish that the residents um, accidentally throw out or, or that comes off a construction site doesn't go out into, uh, into the sea and into, um, you know, into our seafood. Uh, and then those construction sites that have to happen, you're making sure that if there is noise emanating to reduce that impact on on local Kiwis. Um, some pretty pretty amazing uh, things that Canvas can do. Um, is there anything else that you've got planned over and above the things we've talked about so far? Um, it's just actually coming to my mind about, um, you've mentioned we're, we're seeking to stop the pollution, obviously, of the environment. Um, going back to the hush tech barriers and the, and the printing we do on them for our customers, um, we do have our own in-house printer that does all that. Um, we're seeking to utilise that in a, in a better way, uh, just to make it busier pretty much to pay itself off. And um, so we've come up with a, a plastic-free fabric that is now used on a lot of the billboards around the country. So Very we're printing nice. the big wide-format billboards. We've just completed a lot for the National Party this year in view of the election, and it's all on a fully recyclable material. So there's no plastic in it at all. What's it made from? So that was stuff. <laughs> um, <laughs> Non-plastic stuff. Um, it's it's a biodegradable fabric that once they're finished with it, we buy it back and then we biodegrade it. So it's quite an interesting development and certainly a leap forward for the billboard industry. Um, we had the facility here to, to obviously print them, so it was a matter of sourcing the right material and then yeah hopefully that saves the saves the environment as well from that all those plastic billboards that are currently out there definitely and as much as uh, many of us don't want to see any of them whether it's a digital ad or a, or a physical billboard uh, it's great to hear that 
you know, as we move towards more sustainable and things that are, are better for our environment, we don't have to do less. Like there's nothing wrong with billboards per se. Um, if they don't pollute the environment, if you are able to recycle them, then, you know, that as a, an advertising option isn't a polluting option. I think you know, more businesses should look at how to keep the current way we're doing things, but do it in a more uh, nature friendly way. Yeah, that's the exact way that we're thinking as well. Um, the traditional canvas and PVC cover side of the business um, and possibly a lot of businesses like ours in the same industry um, have been going on the same for a lot of years. But what we're finding as we do our homework is uh, there's different ways to do the same things that are better for the environment. Yeah, and the, the, that, um, you know, there's only so many billboard recycled satchel bags that you, you can make and I'm not sure how many people would want one out of uh, a national or a, a labor or maybe I'm wrong maybe actually that's exactly what we need is uh, is is satchels made out of secondhand uh, political party announcements that'd be good <laughs> <laughs> um, what else haven't I asked you Bernie that um, we should we should cover off before we wrap up I, I think you've asked me most of the in, ins and outs of, of where we are. Actually, that's the one Sorry, question I, I haven't asked is, so you, um, you're based up in Northland, right? So close to Auckland, but uh, you know, outside the, that main um, hub of our, our major city. What's it like running a, a manufacturing operation from there in terms of uh, getting talent, in terms of uh, manufacturing there? What, you know, what's it like? Um, it has its challenges, to be honest with you. Um, getting talent, getting good staff is always a challenge. Just, I guess it's because of the population. There's so fewer people here than there would be in the main centres. Um, in saying that, we've got a fantastic team. We've managed to recruit some excellent people. Um, but, yeah, when we, every time we advertise, we, it's always a challenge. Um, in terms of most of the staff here enjoy where they live. They're not looking to move on. They're, you know, there's not many manufacturing facilities. There's a few of them around here, but there's not many of them here. So most of them are happy with a stable job. Um, also creates a bit of a lifestyle for them. A bit more in the country, not so city. Um, but we also have, a, obviously, branches in Auckland and Wellington and in Christchurch as well. So we've, uh, we're familiar with advertising for staff in every one of those locations as well. What do you look for um, with a new hire? What's the, what are the magic ingredients where you know actually this person's going to fit into what we do at Duraflex? Um, possibly the biggest one will be attitude. Um, we've tried a number of things over the years, employing people with the skill set, um, as in physical skills for, you know, cutting, manufacturing the product. But the biggest thing we've found is an attitude, a willingness to learn, pretty much is. Because obviously there's, we service a, a wide variety of products over a, a range of industries. Um, there's so much to learn in terms of manufacturing it that if they're willing to learn, we can pretty much teach them what they need to learn. And, uh, and we'll take, next hiring? Uh, we are currently hiring. What are you looking for? Yep. Uh, just for more factory staff, um, more guys that can just slot into a production team that are yeah manufacturing noise blankets um truck covers the works well if they listen to this they're going to hear exactly what the organization's about and uh it's going to make that a little bit easier to to decide hey maybe that's the place that i should move to because i think um, in post-covid times where um, there is going to be a bit of volatility in the the job and manufacturing sector it's going to require the workforce to move to where the jobs are and I can't think of a better place to move to than uh, up north in that subtropical zone north of Auckland where you've got access to you know, the biggest city, uh, but you've still got this beautiful lifestyle. I'm from Hawke's Bay originally, and so you know the weather is a, a big part of life, and being based down in Wellington has its advantages, uh, but I do miss that warm sun. Yeah, yeah. so we're, we are very thankful that we're not too far from Auckland. Um, it's only... An hour and a half, two hours maximum, um, which uh, is a big bonus to operating a business from a, a rural town. 
Bernie, thank you very much for your time today. I've uh, appreciated our chat and to learn more about uh, what's happening within Canvas, uh, not only in New Zealand, but uh, how you're bringing hush tech to the world uh, and helping uh, minimize the, the noise of these rock breakers uh, in our built environments and in other countries. And I think that the green tech side of things with uh, reducing the, the waste into our um, environment is uh, something that every business should be looking at doing. So I um, yeah, really appreciate your time today and uh, thanks for the, the work you're doing to produce and manufacture in New Zealand. Yeah, thank you for your time too. I hope I've provided something that's worth it. <laughs> Look, absolutely. I, I'm looking forward to um, putting this up on and LinkedIn with our, our business community uh, because it's not sometimes um, it's not easy to see uh, sometimes from someone else's lens what the problem is that you have. And you know, a lot of businesses will realize they're making a ton of noise every day that they build stuff, thinking, "Well, there's no other way to do it. That's the noise it makes." Uh, but when you get introduced to new products and new solutions because you know an organization like yours is just coming at it from a different angle suddenly you don't just change that uh, construction company's life you change thousands of people that share that same space for for months if not years when these uh when these things are being constructed like uh you know like uh, transport and infrastructure yeah that's right and i I'd, I'd just encourage anyone that is possibly having an issue with noise or noisy contractors is just mention the hashtag brand because we will certainly help them out. <laughs> I can see the ad now. It's just you see the noisy <laughs> site and you see someone just going along, just shh. <laughs> That's it. Uh, uh, just like when the All Blacks score a try and just uh, it quietens the audience. <laughs> <laughs> we'll let that noise go. This has been a Kiwi original brought to you by the New Zealand Made team. Thanks for watching. Uh, the New Zealand Made trademark is used by over 1,200 businesses in New Zealand. Uh, the New Zealand Made team licenses that trademark. Check if you're eligible at buynz.org.nz. If you feel that someone should see this, share it with them now. Otherwise, subscribe to youtube.com forward slash buynzmade and we'll see you on the next episode.